Hi, this is Dave, and I'm back again to talk about audio equipment. So today I'll talk about preamplifiers. I've been asked, what is a preamplifier? What does it do? Why do I need one? To best answer those questions, we need to go back. We'll step back to the turn of the 20th century. And we had, at that time, phonographs were popular, so there was recorded sound that were completely mechanical, and there was telephone, which would later become radio telephony. And the telephone and later the radio would use electromagnetic properties. Electromagnetic principles are simple. It's just, it's that when you move a magnet past a wire, a current is created in that wire. Anytime a magnet moves back and forth across a wire, a current is created in the wire. And that's what telephone and radio are completely based on, mostly the electromagnetic principle. When radio became incredibly popular, it was revolutionary, and millions of American homes had radios. And a radio is a completely electronic device. Inside the radio chassis has two distinctive parts on the chassis electronically. To this day, we call them the radio frequency portion and the audio frequency portion. It's all together under the chassis, all the wires together, but they're distinctly different circuits. The audio frequency portion of a radio, or audio amp, which again, we still refer to it like that to this day, that requires approximately a two volt input sensitivity from the receiving portion of the radio. So millions and millions of radios are out in homes that have an audio amp already there built in that's amplifying the radio signal inside their radio. At the same time, they also had phonographs, which were mechanical. The two would become wedded. Ham radio was very popular at that time, and there were two popular ham radio enthusiasts in Ohio. There was, their names were uh, Chor Penning and Woodworth, and they were popular ham operators, and they were working on an improved microphone for their ham stations. And instead of using the electromagnetic principle, they were working on the piezoelectric principle. Now, uh, the word piezo comes from uh, the Greek word for squeeze, and it means that when you squeeze certain crystals, they actually emit an electric current. So you layer enough of them together, and we can actually create electric current in the same waveform as the sound that's pressing against it, squeezing against the surfaces. And it worked, and it actually worked very well. And it had the added benefit that it had approximately a two volt output. The same two volt sensitivity that was needed by the audio amp sections of millions of radios in American homes. So they're already out there in use with these audio amps. And the benefit of amplifying electronically is that you can control the volume and the tone very easily. You can't do that so well with a mechanical amplifier. And you'd also have the benefit of better fidelity. So their system, the piezoelectric system, was used for a cartridge. They called them pickups. At that time, a cartridge was called a pickup. And this is it, the A-static. Two volt output and produced excellent results. So all of a sudden, manufacturers could include a phonograph input or an actual built-in phonograph with their radios. So the radio phonograph combination became very popular, or standalone phonographs. But they all pretty much depended on this. Now, crystal cartridges have limitations. Yes, they put out the two volts that we need, but they're limited in their frequency response, their tonal qualities, and they're finicky. In our climate, they work pretty well. But because they're a crystal, hot, humid environments changed their characteristics. And they didn't work so well in the deep south. And they would often develop problems because they got moisture inside. So the way to fix that was to go back to the electromagnetic principle, where you're moving a magnet past a wire to create the electric waveform. Two companies, Ortophone and Shore, were doing just that. And they came up with a fantastic moving magnet cartridge, both of them did, that was very popular. It would solve the problem of frequency response, had much better frequency response. It was not subject to adverse weather conditions, but there was only one catch. 
it only put out five millivolts. Five millivolts, that's tiny. Meanwhile, all the amplifiers out there in use have a two volt sensitivity. The preamplifier takes that tiny five millivolts and makes it into the two volts needed by amplifiers that are already in millions of American homes. So the main job of the preamplifier is just to step up that tiny five millivolts into two volts that a regular amplifier can use. So anytime you're using a moving magnet cartridge or magnetic cartridge, you need the preamplifier to get that voltage up. So by 1960, improvements in recording technology led to consumer demand for better audio performance. And manufacturers took very profitable advantage of that demand. The first popular preamplifier was one of these small conversion units. Um, Shure made these, a lot of companies made them, Fisher made them. So that if you already had a nice working phono radio combination and you wanted to use the better moving magnet technology, all you had to do was connect that between the cartridge and the existing amplifier. But at the same time, manufacturers wanted to serve the bigger market. So they began to create different combinations of components. So one of the things they created was a separate standalone preamplifier with all the controls and the bells and whistles because it was a good place to put that sort of thing. Volume, tone, record compensation, source switching. And Fisher actually called this preamplifier the master control. Macintosh just called it the preamplifier. But it became a standalone piece of equipment on its own. And another popular combination was to include the preamplifier with a power amplifier so that you'd only have one other piece of equipment, not two other pieces of equipment. Those are called integrated amplifier. When a preamplifier is combined with a power amplifier on one chassis, it's called an integrated amplifier. Sherwood was famous for these, made a lot of those. And finally, the most popular by far, and what most everybody is familiar with, we call a receiver. A receiver is a tuner, a preamplifier, and a power amplifier all on one chassis. These run the gamut from the very entry level, affordable units to some pretty good units. Macintosh did make a couple of receivers. It wasn't their primary market. Uh, Fisher in the early days made some very good ones, so there are some very good receivers out there. The rear panel connections on a receiver are gonna be exactly the same as they are on an integrated amp with the exception of the antenna terminals for the radio. Other than that, they're gonna be almost exactly the same. Now, a new combination has emerged in the last 10 years or so, and that is where a preamplifier is built right onto the plinth of a turntable. And many, many decent consumer grade turntables have that as an option. If that's the case, you don't need a preamplifier in the chain because a preamplifier is already built into the turntable. But if you're using a receiver that has a phono input and you connect one of these modern turntables with a preamplifier to the phono input, you need to be sure to switch off the preamplifier and they will typically have a switch on them that will say line and phono. You need to switch it to the position which cuts out the built-in preamplifier because the preamplifier that you have on your receiver or your integrated amp will be better than using the one on the turntable. So that pretty much explains the history and the use of a preamplifier, and I hope that you've learned a little bit today, and I hope that you will look forward to more videos, and please like, subscribe, and comment below. Thanks again.